Mr. Durant and Bonnie are up in um, Pennsylvania. They went to go visit his parents, and I'm pretty sure he's going to be preaching at their church up there. So he'll be back to be with us next week, and I'm always excited when I have the opportunity to share God's Word. And so today, we're actually going to be concluding our series on design. We have been talking about intentional design. Our word for the entire year that runs from September through August is intentional. We've talked about intentional prayer, intentional gratitude, intentional Christmas, and now we're talking about intentional design. How God made you. How you were created in the image of God. And I just want to encourage you this morning with a scripture from um, let me see here. Ephesians. Don't you hate it when you know where it is all the time in your Bible? And then you go to look for it and suddenly it's not there. <clears throat> this is what it says in Ephesians 2.10. It's a scripture you're all very familiar with. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And I just want to say that you are designed to be about the Father's business. You are designed to do good works. You are designed for action. God has such an amazing plan for your life. And amazing doesn't mean big. It doesn't necessarily mean worldwide. There are small things that we do every single day that go completely unnoticed by the rest of the world. And it does not mean that they are insignificant. Do I hear an amen? Amen. I mean, nobody sees you do your dishes. But if your dishes was never done for a year, there would be problems. Right? Right? So there are small, tiny things that we can do that are very significant. And so sometimes I think when we think about these plans that God has for our lives, they always have to be big. They don't. Sometimes it's just the normal, ordinary, everyday things that we do that matter. And you were designed to be a child of the king. I mean, that right there is so amazing. So we're going to do a quick review of some of these letters. And so first, let's bring up the letter D. All right. What did D stand for? (laughs) Well, not design. The letter D, let's flip it. Next, Next screen, please. We have a lot to go through. All right. Is it coming up? There we go. All right. I love this D because it was filled with jelly beans, and I like jelly beans, right? Sometimes I desire the red ones. Sometimes I desire the licorice ones, right? But I like this D because because of the jelly beans. Now, one thing I want to tell you, I remember Durant saying, a lot of our desires, we have to make sure that they come under what Scripture says, Right? Have you ever had a desire to murder your children some days? Okay, I think we've all had that desire from time to time. Now, that is not, right, a God-given desire, right? That's not something he wants us to do. So those are not the kind of desires that we are talking about this morning. But we're talking about the kind of desires that come from Psalm 37.4. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, in your bulletin... All right, you have a little sheet in there, and I I meant to bring mine up, but somebody waved that sheet at me, because this is going to be interactive today. All right, it's a blank sheet. Thank, nope, not this one. This is a good one, but not this one. Go get the other one, Eli. Thank you. All right, this is a blank sheet, and I want, at the end of service, this turned back in. All right, so we're going to take time to fill this out as we go about today's, um, today's service. So some of you who have been meeting with Pastor Durant and Cassie upstairs have been taking time to fill this out. But I want you to think for such a minute, what are some of your God-given desires? What are some things that God has put inside of you that you want to do 
for the Lord. Like we have all kind of desires. I have a desire to take people on a journey. That is one of the things that I absolutely love to do. Whether it's imperfect courage, leading a trip to Albania, leading a trip to Israel, helping people in their discipleship process. I have a desire to take people on a journey. I know Terry and Vaughn have a desire to see people set free financially and no longer be in debt. They have a desire to do that. My husband has a desire to help people to get their driver's license back when they lose it. Right? That's a desire that God has put in his heart and a way that he wants to help his community. So what are some of your desires? What are those things that God has placed inside of you? And I want you to take just a few minutes and write those down. Another desire that is um, in my heart is the raising up of leaders. I love raising up leaders. I have a desire to write a book one day. I have a desire for marriage ministry. I love seeing marriages make it, right? I love seeing that. Those are some of the desires that God has put in my heart. So what are yours? And write them down on this piece of paper, all right? So D is for desires. God has given you and I specific desires that we are to accomplish. And I want to encourage you to think about what those are. The next thing and the next letter that we're going to be talking about is the letter E. And it stands for what? All right. Now, I like this letter in particular because it was filled with all different kinds of flowers and butterflies and things like that. I have a plaque in my office that says, your beautiful, messy, complicated story matters. Tell it. Each and every one of us have been given a different set of experiences. Bob has things that he has gone through that I have not gone through. Vicki has had things that she has gone through that I have not gone through. And yet, there's similar things that we have gone through together. So I want you to think about your experiences. I love the chapter in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. It says this, The Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. We've all had good experiences, and we've all had lousy experiences. And some are not our choosing, but they are things that happen to us. There are hard things that we have been through, and we get to share those hard things with other people. There are sins that we have committed. Anyone in here ever sin? Yeah. All right? And... In that process, there are lessons that we have learned. There's a forgiveness that we have received. Have you ever met somebody who was having a really hard time experiencing the forgiveness of God? Or experiencing the forgiveness of self? Right? Well, you, as somebody who has been down that path and on that journey, you get to take your experiences and you get to share it with somebody else. And can I just say, for the record, if all you do is share the good stuff, that's not a totality of who you are. Right? Sometimes I think, like I love these young kids who came up and gave a testimony. And sometimes all they get to see is the finished product. And they think, oh my goodness, like that's not my life. That's not what I'm experiencing. And so we have to learn to be brave enough to not just share the good stuff, But to, at times, when appropriate, as God is opening the door, to also share the hard things, the difficult things. Because people need to hear that as well, and how God has brought you through. It's not just the fact that I've been divorced, but it's how has God brought me through that divorce so that I can be a blessing to somebody else. It's not just that I had cancer and went through a really lousy year in 2009. But it's how God healed me and walked with me and never let me go. I love that song. That was my theme song in 2009, Brian. He will never let me go. No matter what, he'll never let me go. I would play that song over and over and over again. 
So then what happens? Somebody comes along, they maybe have a similar experience, they're going through something that isn't fixed quick, quickly, what do I do? I share with them that song. He's never going to let you go. Like your experiences are not just meant for you. Okay? They are not just meant for you. They are meant to be shared with the body of Christ. You are meant to comfort others. You are meant to give hope. You are meant to give passion. You are meant to give forgiveness. Just like you have received it. So I want you to think, and on that piece of paper, I want you to write about some of your experiences. Here's some of mine. I was adopted. I lost a baby right after Danae was born. Um, I have a blended family. I'm a grandparent. I've led lots of missions trips. I've, I've, I've spoken. I've led small groups. I love to journal, right? Those of you who hate to journal but want to learn how, I have experience. I love to journal, right? So those are some of my experiences. I've been married for 31 years. What are your experiences that you can write down on this piece of paper that God wants to use, that God wants to share? And I want you to think about that. I want you to write those down. Our next letter is the letter S. Spiritual gifts. Now, I heard that Brian Carraway knocked it out of the park when he was here and he spoke on spiritual gifts. And I want you to know that every single person in here has been given a spiritual gift. And if you haven't taken the assessment that's online, I want to encourage you, go to our website. Know what your spiritual gifts are. You can read about them in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. Discover what they are. How many of you have taken the spiritual gifts test? Good. There's still a few of you that need to take it. I want to encourage you to do that. Scott, what are your spiritual gifts? Administration. Administration. That's his top one. Who else raised their hand that took it? What's your, what are some of the spiritual gifts in the house? Vicki. Helps. She loves to help. Good. Who's somebody else? Terry. I'm sorry? Mercy. I need to hang out with you. Right? She has the gift of mercy. That's a great spiritual gift. Twanda. Prophecy, the gift of prophecy. That's amazing. Melanie. Intercession. Yes. Good. Anybody else? A spiritual gift that you know you have. Sheila. Encouragement. Jeff. Exhortation. Exhortation. What's another one? Encouragement. Okay. Good. And, and the great thing is when you know what your spiritual gifts are, we know how to partner together. Right? As we come together as a church family, man, if I know somebody who's needing some mercy, pastor's probably not going to send them to me. But I could say, oh, I know somebody who has that gift. That's Terry. Go spend some time with Terry. Right? Because I probably want to whip you into shape. But, but Terry, she has that gift of mercy. And you know what? Sometimes that's needed. And sometimes my gift is needed, right? We all fit beautifully together in the body of Christ. So it's important to know what your spiritual gifts are. Mine are leadership, exhortation, and prophecy. And it's important to know who you are. The next letter is the letter I. I love this picture. A little person just kind of hanging out, loaded with lots of personality, right? So you and I have all been given a personality. And Cassie did a phenomenal job teaching on our individual personality. How many of you in the room are introverts? Raise your hand. Oh, man, there's a lot of you. All right. Brian raised two hands. What? They don't like raising their hands. <laughs> they don't like raising their hands. Well, I didn't make them come up here, so that's a good thing, right? So, um, how many of you are extroverts? Everybody else, raise your hand. You know, that's funny. In a church, there's normally more extroverts than introverts. So, uh, I heard there's a really great book, actually, called Quiet, that is um, really interesting if you want to learn uh, how to discover more about your, your introvert friends. But here's one thing I want to say about like our Myers-Briggs, our Enneagram, our, um, our DISC, whatever test that you have taken, right? Your personality is never an excuse to not be like Jesus. Okay? 
Yes, God has wired us and he has created us to do different things. I remember one time with my personality, which I think is almost the exact opposite of my husband's, he's like, what do you want to do? And I said, can we just like throw some stuff in the car and see where we end up? And he was like, are you serious? I was like, yeah, let's just, let's just like head towards Nag's Head and I don't know, we'll just stop at whatever hotel we want to discover and like spend the night. That just just was not fun for him, right? He is the guy with the plan, and he wants to execute the plan and know the plan and be on the plan. And me, I'm like, I don't know. Let's wait till the last minute because a better plan might come up, right? So our personalities are very, very different. But our personalities are never an excuse to not be like Jesus. And the great thing about personalities, if you can remember this, is all of our personalities, when they come together, they are like this beautiful diamond kind of reflection of the personality of God. Like, he's like Bryn, and he's like Matt, and he's like Judy, and he's like Sherry, and he's like Peggy. I mean, I mean, when we come together, we get this beautiful picture of really of who God is. And so we don't want to pigeonhole people into making them think they have to be just like you. Brian would say, amen to that. I don't need two Sherry's. One is plenty, right? But at the same time, we have to embrace our personalities. Because even though my son-in-law might be an introvert, I'm really more of an extrovert. Now, I need to be sensitive, but... I'm never going to be the quiet person at the table. I mean, that's just not who God made me to be. That doesn't mean I can't be quiet. But my natural personality is to be a little loud and a little boisterous and a little flighty. Because that's just who I am. And so if I keep trying to be like somebody else, I'm never going to fulfill the call and the destiny of God on my life. Because he hasn't created me to be Scott. He's created me to be Sherry. And when you get to heaven, God's not going to say, why were you not like so-and-so? He's going to say, Elise, why were you not Elise? Tony, why were you not Tony? Vaughn, why were you not Vaughn? Like, he created us to be us, made in the image of God, each one of us being transformed to be more and more like him. So, individual personality. Know who you are. Own who you are. But always be in that process of being transformed to be like Jesus. And I love what Pastor Durant said last week about the letter G. And I love this letter because it's on fire. Right? God's call on our lives. It is the trump card of all trump cards. Brian might be an introvert, but there may be times when the call of God on his life makes him be an extrovert for an hour or two, right? And the same is true of me. I might be an extrovert, but God might be saying, I just want you to be quiet and go sit in the back corner and do nothing for these next couple of hours, right? God's call, I almost guarantee you, will always take you out of your comfort zone and beyond your natural abilities. And so my question to you is, what's the last thing God has asked you to do? Think about that. What is the last thing that God has asked you to do? And have you done it? Durant has a saying. He says, God's not going to give you something else to do until you've done the last thing he's told you to do. Some of you are waiting to hear the next thing, but you haven't done the last thing. Right? So, for example, we all know this with our kids. Hey, Go and clean your room. If you clean your room, then I'll take you to the park. Well, you're not going to take them to the park if they haven't what? Right. So they can't go on to the next thing until they've done the last thing. I think the same is true of God. There are things that he asks us to do, and he's waiting for us to do them. And some of us are pretty stubborn. You can say ouch right there. Because you are. You're digging in your heels and you're saying, I'm not going to do that. 
I've done that a time or two. Tried to tell God no. Let me share with you my experience and tell you it doesn't work very well. Right? God has a way of getting our attention. He has a way of shaking us up. And I want to say this about God's call. It is such a beautiful thing. I don't understand why he calls us to do what he calls us to do, where he calls us to go, when he calls us to go there. People will say to me, so are you going to live in this house forever? I don't know. Not if God calls me to go somewhere else. I mean, I might be pretty comfortable here. I might feel like this is where I'm supposed to be for now. But it doesn't mean I'm going to be here forever because God always has the trump card. And if God were to say, Sherry, I want you to move to New York City and plant a church, I would want to have a heart that obeys. Even though I have no desire to go to New York City and no desire to be away from my grandkids or my kids. Right? But there's, but there's this trump card. I had no desire to be the district missions rep. But yet, it was amazing when I said yes to God. The things I learned, the places I got to see, the people I got to be with, the leader that God was developing me into. God's call. What is his call on your life? God called Peter to walk on water. He didn't think he could do it. But God knew he could. What is that next? I got to step out of the boat and do this thing that God is asking you to do. And it's not about what you're equipped to do. It's not. It's about what he's asking you to do. Because God's going to give you what you need to do what he asks you to do. He always does. He always does. So think about that. Write down on that piece of paper, what is God's call on your life? And if you know your individual style, write that too. My Myers-Briggs is, I'm an ENFP, for better or worse. I am a 7 on the Enneagram with the wing of an 8. I don't know that I can actually tell you what those are, but that's what I am. Right? And, and God's call for me, it really is to take people on a journey that's going to draw them closer to Jesus. That's who God has called me to be. Who has God called you to be? And then today, we are talking about N, natural abilities. And now, you have two sheets of paper, and here's a whole bunch of natural abilities. But I picked this letter N because everyone is born to sparkle. And everyone is born to shine. And everyone has natural abilities that God has placed inside of you. And they're just like spiritual gifts. There isn't anyone that can say, I don't have any spiritual gifts. I mean, that's just baloney. You are made in the image of God. He has given you spiritual gifts. A better answer would be, I don't know my spiritual gifts. But it doesn't mean that you don't have any. And the same is true with natural abilities. We have all been given certain abilities. Some of us, how many of you in here are athletic? You're just good at sports. You're naturally good at it. Okay? How many of you in here can sing? You're just good at singing, right? I'm so thankful for the skill that Billy has of turning off my mic when we sing and turning it back on when it's time to speak. And you're all thankful for that skill that Billy has as well, right? I mean, it's true. I've told this story before. One time I was standing by Brian and we were all worshiping and I was just worshiping my heart out. And and he gets close to me and he says, can you move over because I can't worship with your voice. (laughs) Yes, that was an ouch, but it was still true, right? When you sing off key, you just sing off key, and I just can't help. That's who I am. I have not been given the gift of singing. I have been given the gift of making a joyful noise, right? We all have different gifts. How many of you in here are mechanical? You have just a mechanical gift. You can fix things. You can work on things. Yeah, excellent, Eddie. My husband would hold the flashlight for you because he doesn't have that gift. Durant says all the time, in fact, when my kids were young, instead of saying, can Dad fix this, they'd say, should we call Pastor? (laughs) Because it's just not his gift, right? So he can learn some things, 
But he's really good at holding the flashlight. That's just what he does. But he has other gifts. He has, he has other abilities, and I'm thankful for those. He has the gift of being a godly businessman. How many of you know we need that? He has the gift of defending other people and believing in them, and I'm thankful for that. So what are your natural abilities? How many of you just have this gift of organization? You can take a mess, and you can just, yeah, look at that. That's amazing. I need you upstairs in the storage room after church today. Okay? That room is... It's going to be on our church cleaning day project, okay? Let's just put it that way. Um, But there are so many different... How many of you guys have the gift of cooking? Anyone in here with the gift of cooking? Yes! I'm so thankful for that gift, especially when you invite me over for dinner. Or Dana, I'm so thankful that you make all these beautiful meals for our retreats. I mean, seriously, it's... It's a gift. Not everybody can do that. So I want you to think, and in Scripture, one of the things I love is, we just read this on our reading plan. How many of you are actually reading the reading plan? Okay. It is a great reading plan. You're going to go through the most 100 important passages in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. But here's what it says in Exodus 35. I love this. It said, see, God has selected, I can't pronounce these names, Bezalel, son of Uri, son of Hur, the tribe of Judah, and he's filled him with the spirit of God, with skill, ability, and know-how for making all sorts of things, to design and work in gold, silver, and bronze, to carve stones and to set them, to carve wood, working in every kind of skilled craft. And he's also made him a teacher. He and Olabab, son of somebody of the tribe of Dan, he's gifted them with the know-how needed for carving, designing, weaving, and embroidering in blue, purple and scarlet fabrics, and in fine linen. They can make anything and design anything. It also goes on to say in this passage of scripture in Exodus 35 that... He also had the gift or the ability to teach other people to do what they have done. Vicki, I think of you. I'm so thankful that you have been given the gift of knowing how to sew. You've helped my husband on many occasions with his pants. You've helped me with my quilts. I mean, and that's, that's a gift. But how many of you know that just because we have an ability, it can really lay dormant, can't it? We, we can have a gift that God has given us, but we don't pay any attention to it, and we let it stay small and tiny. And yet, when we take that gift and we let the Spirit of God come and fill us up to overflowing and anoint these gifts that we have been given, He can take something that is kind of small and maybe feels like it's insignificant, and He can do absolutely beautiful things with it. And give us dreams. I still remember your dream of making dresses for, or diapers or something to that effect of for other nations. I mean, and you think, well, what can God do with my little gift? He can do a lot if you actually give it to him and use it for his glory. So there are some passages in scripture that I want to read. Um, but I want you to think before I go there, actually think about your... Um, your natural abilities. What are some of your natural abilities? And write them on that piece of paper. One of my natural abilities is hospitality. I love having people over. Um, Another one of my natural abilities is to have fun. I'm just good at having fun and playing around. And um, I just, I really, I don't have any problem with that. Where other people, you know, that doesn't come so easy for them. And so if you don't know how to play... Come hang out with me. I'll teach you. Um, but we all have different um, different abilities. I love to write. I feel like that's an ability that that God has, has given me. Um, so what are some of those natural abilities that God has given you? And write those down. What are you skilled at? What are you good at? And, and don't disregard things like, you know, on this list, I love some of the things it said. Like, 
like motivating people. I felt like that's a gift that God has given me. I, I love to encourage and motivate people and help them do what they don't think that they can do. Cassie, she loves to research, read, gather information. Oh my gosh, I hate it. Like, I am serious. Like, I have a friend, Michelle. I love going on vacation with her because she does all the research and then I get to have all the fun. Like, I don't like researching vacations. When we went to Asheville, I knew Terry and Vaughn had been there. I said, okay, give me your top five because then I can just, you know, I trust them and I can go do that. I am not a researcher. I love to read, but there's a difference between that and actually researching. I am not a researcher, but I love people who have that gift. Evaluating, analyzing da data. I think of Bonnie and her job and what she does. I mean, she's analyzing data all the time. I mean, I would be like, shoot me in the head, right? That is, that is not something I enjoy. Um, counseling, to listen, to encourage. Jess, you have that gift. My husband doesn't. In fact, after a year of counseling, he said, surely God would not call me to something I so hate, right? I don't want to hear people's problems all day. I want to fix them. So he switched to law. He's a much better lawyer than he ever would be a counselor, right? Because of his giftings. Um, oh, uh, one, another one that it had on here that I thought was interesting was landscaping, to do gardening and plants. I thought of you, Judy. You're so good at that. So is Sally Pointer, and so are you, John and Barbara. Me, I help carry plants to their death, even though one of my goals this year is to grow things. I actually went to Lowe's and I bought two plants, hoping that they'll still be alive in days to come. But it's not my gift, so I probably need to hang out with you more, Judy, so you can teach me how to keep these things alive. Um, but some people, they just, they just have a green thumb. You hear people say that all the time, right? I just got a green thumb. I have a brown thumb, right? But some people have the gifts. So what are your gifts? Write those down on that piece of paper. And then here's some things that um, this, is, this is really what I, I want you to see, right? Here we have a beautiful palm tree. And here we have a tiny little bonsai plant. And I want you to look at these two things as I read these next pieces of scripture. Psalm 1-3. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Now I love the... It's called the Passion Translation, and I want you to hear it in that version. Blessed is the man. He will be standing firm like a flourishing tree planted by God's design, deeply rooted by the brooks of bliss, bearing fruit in every season of life. He is never dry. Everyone say never dry. Never, dry. never fainting. Ever blessed. Ever blessed. Ever prosperous. See, God takes our lives and who we were in the world, and he transplants us, he replants us into the kingdom of God. Psalm 92, verses 12 through 15. The righteous flourish like the palm tree, and they grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They still bear fruit in old age. They are ever full of sap and green to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. The passage translation, the end of it says, you're so good. You're my beautiful strength. You've never made a mistake with me. I love that. God has not made a mistake in how he designed you. He has not made a mistake. He has designed you to be like this beautiful palm tree, flourishing in every season of life. Are some seasons hard? Oh my goodness, painfully hard. Are some seasons difficult? Without a doubt. There are some days... I don't know about you, but I've had some seasons in my life where I wasn't sure I wanted to get out of bed and start the day again. 
Sometimes life hits us hard and we don't feel like this palm tree. But this is what we're designed to be. Like we have Christ in us, the hope of glory, to to overcome, to walk through pain, to walk through trials, to be with us in every single situation. I love that. There are there are like four beautiful examples. Then we go to Jeremiah. Jeremiah says this. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. The Passion Translation said this, Its leaves stay green and its fruit is dependable. When you go through the drought, is your fruit still dependable? The way God designed you, are you still dependable? No matter what it faces. No matter what it faces. I mean, God is with us in the good seasons of life as equally as in the hard and dry seasons of life. Our job is to be like this tree planted by the river. That's our job. What do you have to do to stay planted in the river? Tran says this, when you don't know what to do, keep doing what you know to do. Stay in the word. Come to church. Stay in fellowship. Learn to be a worshiper. Stay in prayer. And you know what? It might be a dry season, but I promise if you will stay, if you will sit, if you will be, right, there will come that time when life will flourish again. I read this quote in the book Cultivate, and it said this, spring always follows winter. I've never known spring in all my 55 years not to follow winter. Spring always follows winter. So, don't grow weary in well-doing, for if you faint not, you will reap a harvest. And then the last scripture I want to share is from Ezekiel 47. On the banks, on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, their fruit will not fail. They will bear fresh fruit in every month because the water for them flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. Your calling is to bless other people. Your calling and the anointing on your life is not just for yourself, but it's to be healing in the body of Christ. Like I need Buddy and Buddy needs me. I mean, we are meant in the church to be healing for one another. The problem is, there's way too many of us who have chosen to be a bonsai plant. We've chosen to stay limited. We've chosen to not grow to our full potential. We've chosen not to embrace our design and who God has called us to be. You are not meant to be a bonsai plant. God has no desires to clip your wings so you can't fly, so that you can't flourish. This little tree is meant to look pretty and to sit on a shelf. It is not meant to grow. They, they rearranged it so that this is probably all the bigger it's going to get. Is it going to grow a little? Yeah. If I water it, is it going to stay green? Yeah. But who do you want to be? Do you want to be a bonsai plant? Or do you want to be like a palm tree flourishing by the river? If you don't embrace your design and the way God made you and who he called you to be, then this is who we are at best. But this isn't what God wants. I mean, God wants you to grow and be tall and strong and flexible. He wants you to embrace your craziness, your wildness, your introvertedness, your quietness. I mean, he created you 
with purposes and plans that only you can fulfill. And then if you go to the book of Revelation, I love what it says, and then this will be our last slide. It says in Revelation that you're to be healing for the nations. Last slide. I, I love this picture because you are God's plan A. If I was God, I don't know that I would have picked that, right? But you are God's plan A to take the gospel, to take the kingdom of God to the ends of the earth. He has designed you in such a way. I can't reach Stephen Vicky's neighbors. I'm not their neighbor. But Stephen Vicky are. Right? Kim probably isn't going to come over and witness to my neighbor Jenny. That's my job. God designed me to do that. He placed me on that street in that house to be a light. Like, what we have been given is for the world. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I've asked Brian and the worship team to, uh, to sing this song. It's called um, In Every Season. And, and I just want to close by saying, embrace your design. Your desires, your experiences, your spiritual gifts, your individual personality, God's call, and your natural abilities. I mean, if you will embrace who God has made you to be, come alongside other people who maybe have what you don't have and you want to grow in that area. But God wants us to bloom and blossom in every season. Can we say that? In every season. So I want us to just stand. I want us to sing this song. And I want you to think about who God has called you to be. And it's not the bonsai tree. It's not. You are called to be a tree that has been planted along the rivers, flourishing in every season of life.